All right, Chad, let's do it. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you very much. Welcome to the Tuesday, July 9th, 2024. Wichita Area Metropolitan Planning Organization Transportation Body Meeting. Thank you all for joining us today, either in person or virtually. We do have quorum and we started right at three o'clock. So it's gonna be a great meeting, I can tell. We're gonna go ahead and get started with the regular business portion of the meeting. The first is approval of the TPV agenda for July 9th, 2024. I hope everybody's had a chance to review it. Is I would entertain a motion to approve. Thank you, is there a second? Thank you. All those in favor say aye. Anyone opposed? Seeing none, it passes unanimously. Thank you. Next on the agenda is the approval of the TPV minutes for June 11th, 2024. It was a great meeting. Again, hopefully everybody's had a chance to review the minutes. Thanks to staff for preparing them. I Does anybody have any suggestions or changes? Okay, thank you. Seeing none, I would entertain a motion to approve. Thank you. Is there a second? Awesome, thank you. All those in favor, please say aye. Anyone opposed? You'll abstain, Russ, uh, Mayor Kessler is gonna abstain for the minutes. All right, thank you very much. The item does pass. Next, we have Chad with the director's report. Thank you. Thanks so much, Madam Chair. Uh, good afternoon, members of the transportation policy body. Here, here you go, Chad. Thanks. Of course. Good afternoon. Um, uh, good afternoon. Just do this one. Good afternoon, members of the transportation policy body. Vampo staff is uh, thankful for your leadership, and Vampo staff is very uh, grateful for your commitment for regional transportation infrastructure and your constant guidance on you know funding opportunities for the region and exploring what are those funding opportunities for our region? Um, we have a few items to report to you this uh, meeting and followed by those uh, items, uh, we have some you know, updates, uh, and not any action items today, but some update items such as um, uh, the regional transit plan update that Bill Tro will be here. And then we are fortunate to have Heartland Flyer update as well from uh, Todd Stennis from Amtrak. Uh, thanks to Commissioner Pete Meisner for lining up that for us, uh, you know, to get on one page with uh, Amtrak and its uh, uh, Heartland Flyer project. And we also have usual tip updates and uh, more importantly, population projections. So we have Jonathan uh, from Wichita State University here as well. And the population projection is, uh, as promised by Vampo staff, it will be presented twice so that uh, everyone has a chance to review. Um, with that, uh, with the first item to report is, uh, you know, unified planning work program tasks chart. It's on page 10 in the packet. Um, you know, various, uh, various mm -hmm. items, uh, activities that go on and the status is uh, updated there. Um, in the interest of time, uh, uh, I would like to highlight a couple of important from there. Uh, usual long range transportation plan, MTP is ongoing. Um, and also we have some uh, requests for proposals and new initiatives such as intelligent transportation systems, safe roads to school, and those types of studies. And Peter is going to update on RFPs, requests for proposals in his item. Uh, with that, I'd like to request uh, you know, uh, Peter to update on bi-monthly tip project status. Uh, Peter, thank you, Peter. We're programmed or awarded to receive WAMPO suballocated funding in the current federal fiscal year, or if they received it in a past federal fiscal year, have not yet finished. So uh, as our usual custom here, I'll go through those ones that are to obligate this year or have already obligated. So first we have the Hayesville sponsored Seneca and 63rd Street bike ped pathway, which obligated a little bit earlier this year, let earlier this year in February and anticipated project completion date of summer 2024. We have the Safe Routes to School planning assistance, 
which has obligated. We'll talk about that, the RFP. The RFP has closed, and we are actually looking at consultants on that now. The anticipated project completion date on that would be December 2025. We have the KDOT Witchway video wall, which anticipated let date is October 2024. Anticipated project completion date, December 10th, 2024. Um, tentative dates on that one. Uh, Derby, we have the Nelson Drive realignment. The anticipated obligation date is in summer of 2024, let in July of this year, and completion in December of 2025. We have the Kichai Oliver and Kichai Road intersection project. Uh, that one has obligated this year, it's supposed to let this month and anticipated project completion date in spring of 2025. We have Wichita's multimodal facility uh, that has obligated this year, supposed to let this past month and anticipated project completion date, December 31st of 2025. And we have the Wichita West Street I-235 MacArthur project Anticipated obligation date, September of 2024, with a uh, oh, obligation of September 2024, let of October 24, and completion in spring of 26. Uh, below there, you can see the other projects from previous years that have obligated some funding, but have yet to be completed. Those are in your packet on page 13. On packet page 14 and on the screen, you can also see the map of these different uh, current sub-allocated projects. And as our now usual custom, we always like to append the non-sub-allocated projects that are in the tip from the most previous past amendment, just so you can get a grasp on some of the uh, federal funding that has come to the WAMPO region that's outside of the sub-allocated funding program. And that's on packet page 13 as well. Any questions on the bi-monthly tip update? Thanks, Peter, I appreciate it. Um, the next item we have is uh, Kim uh, updating on Wichita bicycle master plan and, and safety updates as well. Kim, thanks. Yes, good afternoon. I uh, just wanted to give you an update. Wichita is updating their master bicycle plan, which is exciting uh, to see this important update happen. I wanted to just give an update because it is making a lot of forward progress and is about to wrap up, I think, this fall and go to city council for a vote. Um, in this planning process, it has definitely been uh, very well uh, supported by the community and, and public engagement has been uh, robust throughout the process, which is very uh, nice to see. The vision, uh, Wichita encourages bicycling and provides safe, comfortable, and convenient bicycle facilities for all people. And just a few of the, the project goals uh, here I wanted to let you know about is this is really to look at the gaps um, and needs within the city, uh, the city's current bicycle network, and to uh, create a citywide bicycle network that is uh, more connected. Uh, it's looking at priority locations for infrastructure improvements, uh, bicycle parking improvements, which is very needed. Uh, what I'm excited about also is it's looking at the programs and policy updates that are needed to support bicycling. Uh, there's action plan and funding strategies and conceptual bicycle improvements for several priority locations, which I know at the Bike Ped Advisory Board meeting last night, they looked at uh, prioritizing those projects. So just wanted to give you a quick update. What's exciting uh, about this plan is, like I said, it, it will lay out the next uh, 10 years projects and priorities. And WAMPO will be kicking off our regional active transportation plan when this is wrapped up. And that will really look at the regional connectivity uh, to all of your jurisdictions and, and throughout the region. So excited to, to get this project uh, completed so that we can uh, kick off our regional active transportation plan. Any questions on the Wichita? Okay. Yes. This plan is really looking within the city, but it does, they have looked at uh, that full map, but like I said, the regional plan that we'll be doing will then pick up and look at those connections going further outside of the city. So 
Yeah. A question. Yes. Um, so about a year ago, we were looking at that regionally, and there were some proposed maps out there, but that kind of just, I haven't heard anything about that since then. Anything going on with that? Well, we wanted, I think, to wait until the Wichita bicycle master plan was completely updated so that we know where some of those infrastructure and projects are going to be uh, to make those regional connections. So, like I said, looking to kick that off, uh, hopefully this fall. Chad, did you have anything else on? Thank you, Ken. Okay. Safety updates. A few safety updates. Uh, very excited uh, to let you know that we have made progress on the safe routes to schools. That RFP has closed and we have a selection committee that is now reviewing those proposals and uh, hopefully we will be awarding that shortly. The Safe Routes to Schools program will be hiring a consultant uh, or, or consultant teams uh, to help with planning for the schools. And this includes the public school districts and private schools as TPB recommended. So very exciting for these schools to get a safety plan, which then makes them eligible for additional funding uh, to make the improvements. So that one is underway. Also the WAMPO KDOT Behavioral Safety Grants, that application has closed at the end of June. So we're reviewing those applications. We have a selection committee as well. And so hopefully they will be awarding uh, that $50,000 worth of funding um, to organizations looking to really address behavioral safety issues. So thank you to everyone who applied. Then one last uh, update, safe uh, SS4A, which is our safe streets and roads for all. We, as you know, we uh, received the planning and demonstration grant last December. We are working through the agreement with the Federal Highway Administration and making progress on that. Uh, so I will actually be emailing uh, several of the jurisdictions who are part of this uh, project uh, to work with you on some of the uh, demonstration projects and studies that you would like to do so that we can get that included in the agreement and get these projects rolling. So we know. Morning. We have 15 microphones here. None of them work. Uh, do we know which jurisdictions those are? Uh, wow. Off the top of my head, no, okay. I can tell you, um, gosh, we have Andover. Let me try to go alphabetically, maybe. Uh, actually, I'd, I'd have to look at that. Okay. Do the jurisdictions know? They do. Okay. So they nobody's going to be surprised with a, no. okay. Thank you. Yeah. Andover, Derby, uh, Hayesville, Sedgwick County, Wichita. Uh, there's three or four more. Okay, perfect. So yes, Thank they, you. they are aware, but uh, we'll be now hopefully moving into the next steps with those projects. And of course, you can find all these updates on our website at the safety page. Thanks, Kim. Appreciate it. Um, we have a couple items from Marky on public engagement and, you know, the tolling facility. Marky, thanks. Yes. Hi, Marky Jonas, Administrative and Public Outreach Coordinator here at WAMPO. Um, the first thing I'm going to talk to you guys about is that we just finished our third round of public engagement for MTP 2050 or our next long range metropolitan transportation plan. Thank you so much to everyone who completed that as well as helped us with the distribution, sharing it on social media, everything. Um, huge thank you to all of you. We received 474 surveys both inline and paper surveys. Um, staff attended multiple events in the community to interact, engage, and share our progress, and then also get feedback from them. So those report, those results are being analyzed and will be incorporated into MTP 2050. Any questions? Okay. And then um, the Kansas Turnpike became fully cashless on June 1st. Um, which I'm sure many of you are aware of. So we just have a quick video that kind of shows how that works and gives you some more information on that. KTA is converting to a cashless toll system in July, 2024. Let's look at how that will change how KTA charges for tolls. Currently, customers are tolled for travel based on two pieces of data, an entry location and an exit location. The system connects these to make a single trip. However, if one of these pieces of data is missing, operational issues are created for both KTA and customers. Additional challenges with this entry-exit system include time limits, same entry, same exit, and the use of electronic lanes without a transponder. 
Cashless tolling is the solution. It keeps customers moving, removes operational challenges, and violations become a thing of the past. With this new system, drivers enter and exit the turnpike just like any other interstate. Instead of calculating tolls by connecting an entry and exit location, the system adds individual transactions as customers drive through toll zones. What used to display as a single trip on a statement will now be shown as several smaller individual transactions. More transactions do not necessarily mean a higher toll for the same travel. In anticipation of cashless tolling, KTA's board established a new toll rate structure that keeps the Kansas Turnpike's tolls at the bottom of toll rates across the country. The new toll structure will provide a flat per mile rate based on axle count and how the vehicle is identified, either a transponder or the vehicle registration information. This translates into consistent fares for all customers. Cashless tolling will be a win-win for KTA and customers. To learn more, visit driveks.com. And I was just going to mention again that there is a lot more information on the website at driveks.com. Thank you. Great job, Marky. I just want to add, I had the Kansas Turnpike Authority come to my district advisory board meeting last month and just give a quick update. They did a great job and they said they would love to go anywhere and provide more information on cashless tolling. So if anybody um, wants to you know, have them come to a, a council meeting or your advisory board meetings, I know they're looking for opportunities for community engagement and to, to get the word out. So feel free to reach out to them. But great job, Marky. Great. Thank you for letting us know. Thank you, Madam Chair. That is, uh, um, yeah, you know, the spreading the word out was uh, was the key. Um, Peter has a couple of items on grant opportunities and requests for proposals. Peter. Yes, we'd just like to bring the Transportation Policy Board attention to uh, grant opportunities. Uh, there's one that we found, the U.S. EPA Clean Heavy Duty Vehicles Grant Program, uh, the Notice of funding opportunity was open through July 25th, or open through July 25th of 2024. It is a competitive grant program open to states and territories, municipalities, school districts, Indian tribes, nonprofit school transportation associations. And hopefully I don't trip over my words through this last bullet, funds replacement of non-zero emission class six, seven, V heavy duty vehicles with zero mat emission class six, seven heavy duty vehicles. So essentially any heavy duty utility trucks like electric dump garbage trucks, um, other large utility bucket trucks that are electric, you can replace your previous internal combustion vehicles with these alternative fuel vehicles such as electric hydrogen fuel cells. Uh, but I was kind of curious on how big of a truck that had to be to be rated for 19,500 to 33,000 pounds. <laughs> Such things do exist. I did search for them. Um, the uh, $932 million is available through the current notice of funding opportunity. Um, approximately a little over 400 million to areas of non-attainment for the national ambient air quality standards. Currently, the Wampa region is an attainment. 70% of that funding is for school buses. They are also part of that category of internal combustion cars or vehicles that can be replaced. Uh, and the percent of that cost needs to come from, the percent of that cost that needs to come from non-federal sources, your local match, does depend on the type of vehicle. Uh, additionally, notice uh, before applying an organization must be registered on both grants.gov and sam.gov, which can take 10 plus business days. So, Looking at the website, the uh, NOFO or Notice of opportunity, uh, Funding Opportunity Timeline, uh, it opened on the 24th of this year. Uh, we're past the last day to submit questions, but the final posting to those answers will be on July 19th. The application deadline is July 25th. And then in fall of this year, there's a funding opportunity for the Clean School Bus Program. Thank you, Peter. Uh, the, I think the next item is the status on request for proposals. Thank you. Yes, our monthly update on our RFP. So the Intelligent Transportation Systems Architecture, or we're hiring a consultant to help uh, assist in the development and updating our current regional ITS architecture. Uh, RFP has been issued 
It has closed. We have selected a consultant and a draft contract has been developed and is currently under review. We had the travel demand model update phase two, which is for the support services to maintain and get the most use out of our model. Um, a draft contract for that one has been developed and is under review. The RFP is closed. The safe route to school planning assistance that Kim mentioned here a bit ago, the RFP has closed for that uh, consultant as well. We have a selection committee that's formed and we are currently reviewing the proposals. The safe streets and roads for all SS4A implementation grant. We intend to hire a consultant to help with the 2025 application for that implementation grant uh, relative to the fact that it's so competitive to secure that grant. And then finally, we added the automatic bicycle pedestrian counter scheme update on that. So earlier this spring, we issued a request for proposal for the procurement of automatic bicycle pedestrian counters. And after, after extensive careful review of the proposals, detailed evaluations and discussing regard, regarding the product functionality and procurement costs, we have chosen a vendor We've developed a contract and that is also under review. So for the next TPB meeting, I can't imagine why we wouldn't have at least three different consent items for the TPB to consider on the uh, TDM support services, the intelligent transportation systems architecture update and the automatic bicycle pedestrian counters. Um, yeah, awesome. any questions for me? Awesome. Thank you so much, Peter. I appreciate it. And Kelly Rundle is also helping us with the contracts and uh, working with Peter as well. Um, uh, these are some of the few, you know, activities that's ongoing. The next item is August funding redistribution. Um, we just learned on July 3rd from thanks to Rick Backlund from Federal Heavy Administration and also Mike Moriarty from KDART. Um, you know, last year, I think at this time, we got August redistribution. We got like $5 million of funding due to the obligation in the state uh, that was available. Uh, that's a good news. But the challenge is, how do we get projects within a short time span, like a month or so, getting projects obligated by September 15th or so? So we are in the middle of those two challenges. Uh, but fortunately, those projects that are already in the tip, are eligible and Peter and Nick had been diligently working with jurisdictions identifying what are those eligible projects, uh, what are those potential projects to absorb these available funding. So Peter, let me request you to update on that. Certainly, I don't have too much to add from what Chad has said. We're currently working with both our state and federal partners on figuring out what the amount of this August redistribution may be. So as soon as we know more, we'll let you know more on that. Um, but yes, the, as Chad described, the FHWA at the end of the year, at the end of the federal fiscal year, sometimes does have an extra balance that is then offered to the states. And it is a short time window to get this funding on projects and projects need to be in a position to where they could obligate that funding on a very short time frame, And finding those projects can be a bit of a challenge, but we're working with our jurisdictions and finding different opportunities to place that funding. Oh. Sorry. Oh, I see Rick Backlund has raised his hand. Go ahead. Yes. Good afternoon, everyone. I was actually going to put the rest of my remarks later, but uh, uh, good to hopefully, hopefully see you all in person at some point. It's been a very busy few months, but yes. Um, and you know the the overall figure is way more than what's normally can is that Kansas receives. I know that Mampo, you all have done some work on identifying potential projects, and I know that. Uh, uh, information has been shared with KDOT. So there's a lot of work looking to see where these opportunities can be advanced. Uh, that's within reason uh, for the state program. I know that Mike Moriarty is on as well. So I appreciate the work that WAMPO is doing because it is an opportunity. Um, so anyway, uh, I did talk to Chad earlier this week about that. And I know that there were some 
you know, all been doing as a board and a lot of uh, work in terms of identifying potential projects. So um, I know also that the Mark MPO in addition has been doing identification both for Kansas and Missouri. And we've also been looking at potentials for other types of initiatives uh, in addition that are happening in the state. So anyway, just wanted to, to just weigh in a little bit. So thank you. Thank you, Rick. Um, when we had our pre wambo meeting, I asked how much we anticipated the dollar amount would be, and I got the classic answer of more than zero. <laughs> AKA, we don't know yet, but more to come right away. And a thank you in advance to WAMPO staff. I remember this time last year, y'all worked really hard, really quickly, so that we could submit you know, whatever we needed to, to be eligible for the funding and receive the funding that we requested. So um, I know as soon as we get more information from our, our partners, our valued partners, that y'all will do the same thing again this year. So good luck and thank you in advance. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair, for lending the mic. Back to you. <laughs> We're having fun over here. All right, next on the agenda is public comment. This is an opportunity for anyone in the community who would like to make comments or questions, suggestions, anything for three minutes? Do we have anyone who's interested? Not today, Ellen. You're going to impress us and surprise us one day and make some comments. Um, I don't see anyone else, so we'll move on to the next item. We don't have any action items today on the agenda, so we'll go quickly into discussion and updates, and we're going to have Peter stay right where he is, and this is the federal fiscal year 2025 through 2028 tip public comment period. So this particular item is real quick, but we wanted to make an update item because it is quite important. The uh, new 2025 to 2028 tip will is still in its public comment period until the 11th. And we're very, very excited about that. It will be offered for uh, recommendation by the TAC and TPB at our, our for approval at our next meeting in August, uh, on August 13th. Um, it is currently available on our website. I would ask that if you know if you do have a chance or an opportunity to go to WAMPO, look at what we do, go to TIP, and you'll find this available for you to look at in its draft state currently. Again, the public comment period was open or is still open from June 12th to July 11th. It does include the project selection committee's recommendations approved by the TPP on June 11th. And yes, the next steps are recommendation on July 22nd by the TAC and tentative approval on August 13th of 2024. Um, and there is the link there on the, both in your packet and on the screen, if you'd like to take a look at that uh, draft tip. Any questions for me? Seeing none, thank you, Peter. We will move on to the next item is the Heartland Flyer update. And we have Commissioner Pete Meitzner with Cedric County and then also Todd with Amtrak. I think that Commissioner Meitzner is going to kick it off for us a little bit virtually and then do the introduction for Todd. So Commissioner Meitzner, the floor is yours. Okay. Hey, here, all right. Everybody here? Yes, okay. sir. All right. Hey. Thank you for letting me be virtual. Sorry, I got tied up and not there in person. But uh, um, <clears throat> there was a, uh, I think some of you know, there was a, a, a celebration in Oklahoma City about the Heartland Flyer and Amtrak and Oklahoma, the, the Chamber and Texas, Tex.O.K. Dot, dot, all came together to, uh, to kind of give an update on the extension of the Heartland Flyer. And I was I was privileged enough to be included on a panel with uh, the mayor of Oklahoma City, and but there's a lot of other updates. And a really good update was from uh, was from uh, Amtrak that gave a real good summary of not only the extension itself, but uh, kind of the they showed an outline and, and confirmed other information that I had kind of thought myself was in the works, but. Uh, so we asked Todd and, uh, and Amtrak if they could come uh, and attend uh, virtually fine and, and show that that brief uh, slideshow and update for you all, because I, I get a lot of questions from people about it. And I think it's valid for for Todd to, uh, and I've known Todd for, Todd, how long have we known each other? Maybe 10 years or so. Since it's, been a, it's been a good decade. <laughs> yeah. So 
I was told when I started this that it'd take 10 years and, and it won't get done yet. It's It's been like nine years and six months. So I still got six <laughs> months to get done. But anyway, so thank you. And Todd, I'm going to turn that over to you. And I think, Marky, you're running the slide deck possibly for Todd? Yes. Okay. All right. So thank you again and apologize for not being there live to everybody. But here's Todd Stennis from Amtrak. Todd, take it away. Oh, great. It's a pleasure to be with you all this afternoon. Um, and I apologize, too, that I could not be there in person, uh, but certainly look forward to a future event where I can come see you in person and, and sit down and, and meet everybody. Uh, I've known Commissioner Meitner, as he mentioned, for, for all intents and purposes, a good solid decade. Uh, I know that we've got KDOT uh, present as well, which I'm, I'm happy that KDOT is there as well, because I want to extend a tip of the hat to them. Uh, because without their Carter ID application, we probably would not be having this conversation and certainly to the level that we're at. Uh, as Commissioner Meitner mentioned, uh, just last week, we did the 25th anniversary celebration of the Heartland Flyer. Uh, it came on in 1999, and we have been working diligently with our state partners to try to find an avenue to extend that service north to Newton, Kansas, uh, here in recent years. Uh, so to that end, I certainly want to have that conversation with you all today, and, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have to the best of my ability once we're done. Uh, but again, tip of the hat to, to Commissioner Meissner, because the one thing I will tell you about these passenger rail expansion projects is they all take champions. Uh, and they take champions at all levels, the state level, the local level, uh, and even the federal level. Uh, and to that end, uh, tip of the hat to Commissioner Meitzner, and again, tip of the hat to KDOT for taking on the, the, the due diligence of going after the Carter ID. So let's get started. Let me tell you a little bit about Amtrak and what's going on relative to the Heartland Flyer. Uh, for those of you in the room that don't know a lot about Amtrak or don't know much about its history, let me give you just a little bit of background. Um, Amtrak was created in 1970 with the Rail Passenger Services Act. The genesis behind that was all the railroads were in a situation, or most of them were in a situation, where they were hemorrhaging uh, money on operating passenger trains due to a variety of reasons, from the jet age to the interstate highway coming along and the icing of the, on the cake being the loss of the mail contracts. Once that happened, the railroads were looking for relief on their common carrier obligation to carry passenger trains, and thus the creation of Amtrak through the Rail Passenger Services Act in 1970. Amtrak began service on May 1st, 1971, with a route structure that is very similar to what we look at today and what we see today, uh, but where we see growth in the opportunity of, of expanded passenger rail services in the corridor network, and I'm going to talk more about that in just a little bit. Uh, but today, we have uh, over 200 280 trains per day. We have we operate over 40 routes covering a 21,000 mile plus network and over 500 stations around the country. We are set, setting record ridership again post COVID and pre COVID. We're at 32 plus million riders, um, and we are really 46 percent more energy efficient than automobiles. Our top speeds will soon be 160 miles per hour. Right now we're running at 150 plus on the Northeast Corridor, and we're running at 90 and 110 in areas on uh, short distance markets outside of the Chicago area and on the route of the Southwest Chief. Let's go to the next slide. So this is what the Amtrak network looks like. And in short, the goal that you see are the foundation, what I call the foundation, the long distance network. We operate 15 long distance network trains around the country. And that's, uh, as I mentioned, the foundation, but we also have the short distance trains that is the fastest growing market in the blue. Uh, those trains are routes that are less than 750 miles. In many of these instances, the blue is overlaying the gold. For example, uh, over the route of the Southwest Chief out of Chicago, it shows gold all the way down to, to the western side of Illinois, but that really is served by both corridor trains and the, the long distance trains, the Zephyr and the Southwest Chief. And the same thing on the route down to St. Louis and down to Carbondale as well, amongst others around the country. The red is the Northeast Corridor, which Amtrak primarily owns the bulk of that mileage, with the exception of a short distance north of uh, New York City and a short distance in and around Boston. Amtrak owns the bulk of that mileage there. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, so let's talk about one of the creations, or two of the creations, rather, in uh, Amtrak's inception with the Rail Passenger Services Act. It did two things. It gave Amtrak preference and access to the railroads. And let me just touch on that just a little bit. 
So the bulk of Amtrak's mileage, that 21,000 mile network that we talked about just a moment ago, operates over host railroads. In the case of, of Wichita and Kansas, we're going to primarily be talking about the BN Santa Fe, formerly the Santa Fe Railroad. Um, and we operate over that network throughout the country on an access agreement that was created in 1970. Uh, the access agreement allows Amtrak to operate on any railroad anywhere in the country, whether they were an original Amtrak partner or not. In addition to that, Amtrak also received what is known as preference. Uh, now, again, in, in the contract and in the creation through the charter, it, it says that Amtrak trains must receive dispatching uh, preference over freight trains, the right to go first, if I may. Does that always happen? No, it doesn't always happen. But the important thing is Amtrak has both of those key things relative to the federal law and the statute that created Amtrak. So those are those are two things that are important. Now we've got to get to a point of better enforcement of, of the preference. Next slide. So let's talk about going back to the service lines. Let's talk about the state supported just a little bit. The state supported line of, of Amtrak's business, or I call it as a tripod, the state supported side, the long distance side, and the Northeast Corridor. The state supported side has evolved over a number of decades. It originally started out as 403B service, and it was just structured different from what it is today. But it really changed in 2008 with the passage of, of the Passenger Rail Investment Improvement Act. And what was key in that was Section 209. And Section 209 essentially reestablished how short distance passenger trains would be funded. In short, anything less than 750 miles will primarily be funded by the states, and it will be based on a model and a methodology that is agreed upon by all the state partners. If you look on the right side of the screen here, we've got all the state partners listed along with the routes. And it essentially makes up about half of Amtrak's ridership throughout the country and certainly the fastest growing. Recent expansions, we just started the, the new Borealis service from Chicago to Minneapolis. Paul last month, um, and then, or actually earlier, yeah, la late last month, um, we are also planning to expand service on the Mississippi Gulf Coast out of New Orleans over to Mobile, hopefully by early 2025 with the new Gulf Coast service. That'll be two round trip frequencies. And then, of course, the genesis for all the new service expansion opportunities is through the Corridor ID program, which we're going to talk more about that in just a minute. Next slide. As I mentioned, the, the long distance service is our foundation. We have 15 long distance routes across the country. Uh, Kansas is served by the Southwest Chief, and that is a, a long distance service that connects from Chicago to Kansas City down through Newton and out west into Los Angeles. Uh, we also have a service that runs down through Texas via St. Louis that I mentioned earlier on the map that's known as the Texas Eagle. And I mentioned those two services because the Texas, the, excuse me, the Heartland Flyer is essentially a bridge train between those two services, between the train and the connecting motor coach service that we have today. Next slide. So let's talk about the IIJA funding opportunity. It's a $66 billion investment in rail, with $30 billion of that going to the NEC and the FRA uh, funded through the, the state NEC projects there. You've got $24 billion for capital there. But then there's another $28 million that is going out to can be applied for by non-state, or excuse me, by state partners, not and it has to be spent on non the non-NEC network to the tune of $12 billion. So when you look at this, you say, OK, did all of this money go to Amtrak? There's a big misperception that all of this money went to Amtrak and Amtrak gets to decide where it all goes. That is not the case at all. Amtrak only got a small portion of that. And that's the six billion dollars that goes to the NEC for the capital needs. If you notice up on the left hand side, there's still eight billion dollars for multipurpose grants. And then the twenty two billion that Amtrak got all total has got to be spent on specific capital needs in different parts of the country, with the exception of the, of course, the six billion that's got to go into the corridor, which is part of that. But nonetheless, the, there is a misperception that that sixty six billion went to Amtrak. It's not. It's done through a competitive grant program through the Federal Railroad Administration. The other thing that's a misperception is that this $66 billion can be used for Amtrak to operate the national network on. That is not true either. Again, it's got specific strings attached to it for specific purposes, the bulk of which has to be applied for through the competitive grant programs, which we're going to talk more about here in just a second. Next slide. So relative to the Carter ID program, there were applications that came from all across the country. There were 69 applicants that were awarded 
uh, coming out of the CID program late last year. And just to put a, a couple on the map here that we want to talk about of what has been coming up as far as expansions, we had an expansion service in the Ethan Allen in 2022. We've expanded service in the Commonwealth of Virginia. Uh, with a third daily trip between New, uh, excuse me, between Norfolk and Washington, the Berkshire Flyer is a weekend service between New York City and Pittsfield, Mass. Uh, we added a fourth train between Charlotte and Raleigh, and then the Cascade service is our Portland Seattle service, uh, which came on in 2023. And as I mentioned earlier, Borealis, the new second frequency, in addition to the to the Empire Builder going to Minneapolis, St. Paul. Uh, but the Carter ID program that the Federal Railroad Administration has administered has ha got 69 applicants. So where, where is that 69? Where are those 69 applicants and, and where is that funding going to go to? So it works in a multitude of different ways. So you've got a couple of programs. We've got the Carter ID program, which is the basic framework for service expansion. It's a $500,000 grant going to each applicant to initiate the process of planning. Um, but in addition to that, in the IIJA funding, the $66 billion that I mentioned, you've also got the Fed State Program, uh, which is for planning and capital grants. And you've also got the FRA's R&E Program. The R&E Program is an operating program for temporary operating grants. And it's really a step-down program, which the Heartland Flyer would, extension would be eligible for because it's a former Amtrak route. So that's something to keep in mind going forward. And they are pro everything is prioritized based on the CIDP awards. So the other thing that you want to keep in mind is the FRA long distance study. And some people are getting confused about the FRA long distance study and confusing it with Carter ID. They're two totally separate things. Um, the FRA's long distance study is specifically looking at the expansion of the long distance network and how it could potentially work. And the Carter ID program is focused primarily on the short distance routes. There are a couple of uh, long distance awards, but they were directly to Amtrak for taking tri-weekly trains and extending them to daily trains. Next slide. So this is the, the stair step, if I may, of how the Carter ID program works. And I think the most important thing is you all in the state of Kansas are in a position, courtesy of KDOT's leadership and taking the initiative to take this step now that you're in the program. We're at the orange step here, the project planning, if I may, or I should say KDOT is, because um, I don't want to take any thunder away from KDOT and what they've done, because they are, they are off to the races, and we're looking forward to what they are going to hopefully have out very soon. So this is, gives you the stair step example of how this works. Once we're done with the project planning, you, then you go into the project development stage, then the final design, construction, and operation. And I know that sounds simple, but there's a lot of steps in the process, and there's also some requirements along the way that we're going to talk about and some needs that we're going to have to have, and I'm going to share with you some examples of what's happening in some neighboring states. Okay, so here's where we are, and this is what it's looking like for you guys. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the $500,000 award for CID has been awarded to KDOT to lead the way on the effort for the Heartland Flyer extension. Um, the good news is with that application is KDOT had support from ODOT and TexDOT through letters of support, and you say, okay, why didn't they all apply together? The FRA made it very clear they wanted one applicant and one lead applicant only, not multiple applicants. So it made perfect sense for KDOT to lead that effort, and we certainly appreciate them doing so. So right now, we're, you're, you're in the stage of laying the groundwork for the service development plan, which is where KDOT is in this process. Um, just to give you an idea, the main thing in, in Kansas, as far as the impact for expanded rail service, is you're going to have new service to Arkansas City, Wichita, and Newton. Now, the idea is, as I mentioned earlier, is for this service to be able to be a bridge service between the long distance trains, the Heartland, excuse me, the Texas Eagle, and the Southwest Chief. What's unique is if we could make some minor tweaks to the schedules of probably both trains, the Heartland Flyer and the Southwest Chief, we have an opportunity for all four trains, if I may, to meet each other in which, excuse me, in Newton, Kansas. And what I mean by that, the Southwest Chief trains three and four going both directions and the Heartland Flyer all being in Newton at approximately the same time. 
give or take, but with an opportunity for passengers to make the transfer to go all three different directions, coming north on the flyer, then turn around going south on the flyer, and then obviously east and west on the southwest chief. Just a general idea of what could potentially happen, uh, that opportunity exists there. There's not many opportunities around the country where we have a situation like that, as I would call it, the perfect storm of scheduling working to our advantage, but this is one of those opportunities where there is the potential for that to take place. Next slide. So a little bit more in the CID process. So right now, this is what it's looking like as far as the proposed extension. Uh, the service would come north out of Oklahoma City, just continuing north on, on a schedule somewhat analogous to where it is. But again, as I mentioned earlier, probably tweaking a little bit with the stops that you see here in Kansas and then picking, I mean, excuse me, in Oklahoma, and then picking up again, Arc City, Wichita, with the termination in Newton uh, there at the Amtrak station that we serve today. Uh, where we would connect with the Southwest Chief. So this is a really unique opportunity. And obviously, the other thing that would happen is this would replace the connecting motor ser coach service that we have in place today. Um, and KDOT mentioned, and I don't want to uh, put Corey on the spot, but he did mention that the, the plan is for KDOT to have uh, the implementation plan finalized this summer. That was mentioned during the, the uh, Heartland Flyers 25th anniversary event just last week. Um, once that's done, then the next step is something that's key in what I do in my capacity as the government affairs director, and that is to start looking at the matching dollars. Because the first step, as I mentioned, is $500,000. There isn't, There was no match requirement for that. But the subsequent steps are going to be a 10% uh, requirement match in the next step, and then all other steps beyond that are going to be 20%. So there's going to have to be a, a, a match identified at the state and or local level uh, to advance the subsequent steps. So let me just touch on that just a little bit, because this is this is what's really key for everybody to know. Uh, and John, I'm going to give you an example of a couple of states and what they've done to advance that, because you have neighboring states in Louisiana and Mississippi that are taking some some uh, early steps to try to advance proposals to where they're ready to go. Uh, but it's critical at this point for us to start looking to the legislature to identify matching funds. Um, whatever that mechanism ends up being uh, doesn't really matter as long as matching funds are identified. And it, it, we're not talking about a significant amount of money, but but I would say that it's probably going to be a steady flow of funds that's going to be needed on more than just a single annual basis uh, or a single year basis uh, because we want to get through the process and we want to make sure that you guys can exercise every bit of federal money that is available now and continues to be available. And the key to, to this that is that I've mentioned to mayors and state leaders alike is just a few short years ago, if we were doing this exact same plan, 100% of everything was going to be in your hands of responsibility. Now we have a federal funding partner for the first time, and you've got an 80-20 federal funding partner. So instead of $100, now you've got $80 coming from the feds, and we've got to identify 20 So it, it, for every $100 that we have to spend there. So let me just give you an idea of what some neighboring states have done, and I'm going to start with Louisiana. Uh, Louisiana is, is also a successful applicant for corridor ID. They knew they were going to be applying for the corridor ID program, on um, two different routes, uh, one a route across north central Louisiana uh, along the I-20 route where they went after a Fed state grant. They weren't successful for the first go around, but they're going after it again. And then they're also looking for expansion of Carter service between New Orleans and Baton Rouge. And I mentioned these two things because the state legislature through two different delegations, a North Louisiana delegation, South Louisiana delegation said, look, we've got all this federal money together. We have opportunities here, and we don't want to miss the opportunities going forward. We want to make sure the DOT is in a position to advance the subsequent steps. So they went ahead and appropriated $22 million, uh, 12 for the New Orleans Baton Rouge Carter and 10 for the I-20 Carter. And they've also done some subsequent uh, appropriations to benefit both routes as well. So they've got money in the bank in Louisiana for the Louisiana Department of Transportation to utilize for the subsequent steps. Uh, after this initial Carter ID award. And what I would encourage you all to do is do the same thing. We're already talking with Oklahoma about it. We'll continue to talk to you all in Kansas about this uh, because that's what it's going to take. And you don't want to miss out 
on one of these subsequent steps once KDOT has everything ready to go with the implementation plan. We want to make sure that those dollars, match dollars are there so that KDOT can continue to advance the proposal as they've done so well and so far. That is a, a quick overview of where we are on the Heartland Flyer uh, extension opportunity. I am happy to answer any questions. And again, I look forward to an opportunity to see you all in person at a future date. Thank you very much. Hey, Todd. Yes, this, sir. Uh, a couple of things. Um, thank you again, Corey Davis and uh, Mike Moriarty. You're on uh, for uh, helping support this effort. But uh, dude, when we are awarded the corridor ID, uh, one of the, of the 61 or whatever it was, how, how many applicants were there again around the country? A couple hundred or something? I don't know how many applicants there were, but there were 69 awards. I can't tell you that. 69. I think there was over 200 applicants, which was good. And then the other thing that you've mentioned before, and uh, is that when you had that national map up, um, you guys like to try to connect population centers, um, cities, and uh, and there's only out of the top 50 cities, of course, which taught me in about 49th or 50th or 51st. There's only three cities that, that are not connected on your service, and that is uh, what Nashville, Wichita, and Las Vegas. Sir. And if you comment on that and then take any other questions. Absolutely. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, the the uniqueness of this is, and I'm gonna I'm gonna use my my residential uh, approach to this right now. The uh, the Heartland Flyer, as I call it, is a cul-de-sac operation. Goes up to Oklahoma City, turns around and com comes back. We want to eliminate the cul-de-sac and put that railroad all the way through from a passenger standpoint uh, through to Newton, Kansas. Get Wichita on the railroad map. You're on the Amtrak map through the connecting motor coach service, which I might add has been very successful since we implemented it. And that actually speaks volumes uh, for where you all are and KDOT's. Uh, commitment to this because when you've got passengers that are utilizing the connecting motor coach service between Newton and Oklahoma City via Wichita in the middle of the night, it speaks volumes for how much better it could be if you had a connecting train service that that bridged two long distance services. So, uh, Commissioner Meitzner is exactly right. Adding Wichita in that regard uh, certainly enhances the national network. Uh, it enhances Amtrak service, and it certainly will contribute to being an economic contributor to the to the Wichita area. Um, as we as he mentioned earlier, Las Vegas is another one of those communities. Obviously, that's a little bit bigger challenge for us right now, uh, and so is Nashville. Quite frankly, Nashville hasn't had Amtrak service since 1979 with the loss of our Chicago, Florida service, and and there's been a desire to put it back ever since. But that's probably one of those things that fits better as a long distance model than it does a short distance model, depending on how you look at it and, and what the route might be. You guys are are, and I'm gonna. I've said this before. I said it the other day in Oklahoma City. I really believe this. Um, I think this is a low-hanging fruit opportunity for Amtrak and for our state partners to try to make this happen. And I think it is a low-hanging fruit opportunity to enhance what we already have. Uh, yes, it is an investment, but all modes of transportation require investment. Um, and this is no different from that. And certainly it's an economic advantage to you guys to be on the railroad Amtrak map. And we certainly want to do what we can to contribute to that. Again, happy to answer any other questions you might have. Any questions for Todd? We were glad, uh, Ellen and I were making eye contact the second time you got it right and said it was Arc City or we prefer our Kansas yeah, it, it, city. It, it, yeah, Arc City. <laughs> my, my, my apologies. And, and and that is one of my hometown trains crossing Lake Pontchartrain coming out of New Orleans, for those of you wondering what that is. Any other questions or comments? I, I, I will mention, if I may, I will mention one other thing. I, I have had the pleasure of coming to Wichita many times. Um, and, I, and I've been to Wichita on a special Amtrak train, but I want to come back to Wichita on a regularly scheduled revenue train. So uh, I look forward to that opportunity and look forward to working with you all going forward to help make this a reality. Well, thank you very much. And we'll look forward to you visiting Wichita. And Commissioner Meitzner, thank you so much for the background and for the introduction of Todd. Yep. Thank, thank you all talks, very much. Todd, Todd's from the South, but he talks fast like he's a Yankee. But that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> for, for a Mississippi thanks. boy, I guess I do okay. Thanks, Tom. <laughs>
right. Thank you. Thank you all. Have a great day. You too. Thank you, sir. Uh, okay, bye -bye. next next on the agenda, Wichita Transit Network Plan. Raven, I think, is presenting. It says on the agenda, Raven with yeah. but I saw Penny Feist was on. Raven, are you are you online, Raven? Oh, okay, great. Yeah, oh, thank thanks, you, Raven. Raven. thanks, Raven. No worries. Um, this is going to just be kind of a brief update as we will maybe try to plan for the consultants to actually give you a full overview next month as we are in process of reviewing comments from our second survey that was out between May and early June and also responding to some of the engagement that we took place with the stakeholders um, meeting that we also held on June 11th. We had two different sessions there. So as we're going through some of those comments, different things like that, they will begin to look at making some adjustments to the initial concepts that were presented within that survey. So a lot more information to come next month. Um, but I do want to let you know that as they are beginning to review these documents, things as far as that, they are also segueing into the additional items listed in that scope, which is going to look at the future growth. So at some point you will begin to see kind of a menu, kind of what the cost of maybe expanding hours, um, expanding routes, adjusting frequency, Those that information will begin to come out as well. Looking at the different capital and infrastructure needs that may be needed as we continue to grow and also funding options. So like I said, next month, they should have a whole lot more information to share. Um, but also, while I do have everyone's attention, kind of just want to give a couple of just transit updates, um, letting you know that kind of our ridership now is over 518,000. So that's not bad for six months into service for the year. Um, the veterans ride free. That MOU has was approved by council. So that is going to continue. That program will last through July of 2026. Also, we've been working with various different um, youth groups. So we have a lot more youth out there riding, giving transit a try this summer. And important for us is that we just completed our triennial review, which we are having some great positive feedback from the contract contractors. And so we're just waiting on that preliminary report so that we can go in um, before we have that final draft. So any questions? Questions for Raven. I just want to make one real comment, quick comment, Raven, you mentioned the Veterans Ride Free Program, and I just want to give a shout out to the United Way of the Plains and the VA. Um, they were able to extend uh, funding for that program for two more years. When we found out, I'm on the Greater Wichita area, the Greater Wichita Area Veterans Advocacy Board, and we found out the funding was going to end. And so we reached out to Senators Moran and Marshall and Congressman Estes and both of and all three of their staff were committed to trying to help us find some funding. But because of the quick time turnaround, it didn't quite happen. But the VA and the United Way of the Plains stepped up to make sure that happened. And we heard from many in the community, especially at the United Way, that if that program ended, it could actually tip some of our veterans into homelessness if they had to start paying for their own transit or potentially they couldn't get to a job. And so just, a, again, a huge thanks to our partners in the community. And now transit... Um, and I will continue to work with our electeds at the federal level to see if we can find some more secure long-term funding. But this bought us a little bit of time. So thank you, thank you, um, Raven, and thank you, Penny, the interim director, for all you did to move quickly and get everybody all the information they needed so we could continue the funding. And thank you for assisting in making those connections so that we could move forward. Absolutely, my pleasure. Thank you, Raven. Thanks for the great update. Uh, next on the agenda is the Regional Transit Imp Implementation Plan update from Bill. So, Bill, this time it is you. I just go down then. Oops. Oh. Sorry, I messed it up. I'm burning my time. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, should, or these should work too, I think. Okay, cool. Okay, uh, good afternoon again. My name is Bill Tro, and I'm a transportation planner with SRF. And what I want to do is give you a brief update. And a lot of what I think my update is going to be is more of an ask of you 
I'm going to kind of go a little bit ahead here that um, I am hoping, assuming that most everybody on the policy body had received an email from WAMPO uh, requesting that uh, you provide a little bit of input from your community's perspective on the range of alternatives or those ideas that we have been looking at um, as part of the regional transit in, uh, implementation plan. And what I want to do today is just reiterate, reinforce that ask of you as, um, as representatives of each of the communities um, across the WAMPO region, that if you did receive the email, if you have not had an opportunity to get together, have a conversation about those alternatives, come up with ideas from your communities of which ones that you believe that you can support, which ones that you you just that you would rather that we not continue to look at those also that are not applicable to your community, and um, and that what I want to point out here is that the importance of getting this information from you is that okay we we've, we've developed kind of the hopper of ideas the hopper of alternatives some of those are are alternatives and concepts that could be somewhat universal a law around the the uh, WAMPO area outside of Wichita the idea of adding more demand response service uh, you know is is potentially applicable in each of the communities but the communities I think have to take a look at each of those alternatives with an understanding of how it serves the needs of your particular community and whether or not those are alternatives that you believe that you can continue to support. Um, because once we have an understanding of which of the alternatives communities support, communities are, are all in on or all in as a funding partner or as a operating partner, that then we can start to figure out more of how we end up putting together a governance structure that provides an efficient transit system within the entire WAMPO area, or those areas at least where service is viable from a demand standpoint, from a, uh, a community support standpoint. So everybody should have received an email that contained the packet of, of ideas, um, some information on ridership associated with those ideas, some information on cost associated with those ideas, including what we anticipate for an annual operating cost, what we and what portion of that annual operating cost we would assume or we would estimate would be so, or attached to the, the locality um, that would be desiring that service. So, so it's understanding that, that any service that could be provided could have funding partners, including uh, Federal Transit Administration, including the state, um, so that but we need to have an understanding of what of the alternatives really has support uh, because then we can figure out how to go through and put together a governance structure that may in include um, combinations of communities that may include individual communities. It could also be a situation where there are there is enough um, um, interest, there is enough support for particular alternatives, again, like more demand response service, well, maybe it makes sense for the counties, county or counties, to be the operator of that system with additional funding support from each of the communities where there could be additional transit service. So the, the first step of that, though, comes back to um, getting input from each of the communities. I, we included in there um, also a link to a, a questionnaire or, or kind of a repository of what your responses to those, those each of those alternatives might be, whether or not you're saying, well, it's really not applicable to us, you know, a, 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 a commuter service to an outlying community that is you know, still 20 miles from Wichita, a relatively small community, probably doesn't make a whole lot of sense. That's a not applicable, that there are others that you may say, well, this just isn't for us as a community. We would dismiss that. And then there's two categories of, yeah, we like the idea. We like the idea and we're interested in being the provider. We like the idea, but we need a partner to be the provider. Um, and that, again, once we have that information, 
we can move to the to what I would see is really is the final step of the of the study of putting together a governance structure, putting together an implementation plan. Um, with that, um, I guess I'll just ask the if if those of you that have looked at it, are there any questions? And that if you want me to sit in on a a session with your locality, please let me know. I'd be more than happy. Excellent. Any questions for Bill? Okay, well, Bill's made an offer. So if anybody wants to get in touch with you, what should they do? Um, I probably should have included my email. They can reach out to WAMPO they staff? reach out to WAMPO. Okay, and they'll connect you? Cool. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you for your presentation and for being here today. Yeah. Appreciate it. Next, we have Jonathan with um, Sieber, who's going to talk to us about population projections one more time. Thank you. Can everybody hear me all right? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so for anybody who was not at the previous TPB meeting or the recent TAC meetings, the context of this is CEDBR is the Center for Economic Development and Business Research at Wichita State University. Um, we were partnered, uh, we partnered with WAMPO to help produce population projections out to 2050 uh, as part of the MP, uh, MTP 2050 project. Um, uh, and so uh, contacts on the centers, uh, CEDBR is the official provider of the population forecast for the state for Kansas. We have a long history of doing that. And we just updated our county level population forecast out to, uh, out to 2070, uh, 2072 actually, um, last year. And uh, there was another update to that this year. Uh, our, uh, that as a county level forecast, right, is a little bit different than forecasting for communities. So uh, there, there was a bit of adaptation that we had to do from that methodology to step into this WAMPO, uh, like regional population forecasting and the, the communities within it. So uh, the background, uh, so that's the background on the project. Um, uh, the purpose of uh, today is to give you an update on where we've been since the last meeting and where we go from here. Um, the uh, overall concept, right, uh, is that uh, this is an age cohort survival model, which means that you take the existing population in each of these communities, you age them up uh, like over time in five year increments, and they're, they're subject, subject to fertility, mortality, and migration. So that question of migration is a little bit more complicated than it is uh, at, like, when you look at these more granular communities than it is at looking at an entire region. Right. Um, when we did this, uh, we recognized that there are a whole lot of individual forecasts for the communities in how their population is going to grow. For a lot of those, they weren't necessarily taking into account one another's growth. And in an area that is as connected as the Wichita Metro, sometimes that can end up with uh, communities fighting one another to attract population. So we decided from the outset that there needed to be a constraint. Um, uh, in this uh, methodology and that everybody needed to be on the same uh, grounds as far as how that projection was calculated. Um, the, that, that constraint that we developed was the previous regional forecast that we developed last year, which was, uh, which was actually rather ambitious if compared to the city's history. Now, uh, so the way that we got at that migration was by looking at these three different variables, community net migration, which is the historical migration trends into each of these communities, and we weighted that at 20%. The uh, employment forecasts that CDBR produced late last year for WAMPO, uh, also as part of this project, uh, looking at just the long-term employment forecast uh, across each of these communities. And then building permits data. And this is really where the conversation, the meat of this conversation has uh, been over the last few weeks and months. So the, uh, the element of building permits data really allocates a, a population and helps it grow in communities that are making major investments in where people can live, right? If you're using the existing housing stock, you're, you're immediately constrained, especially given housing market trends going backwards. So building permits, we needed the data on building permits from communities and to understand how that drives, uh, uh, how it drove those communities in the past and where it's heading in the future. So we uh, have now uh, collected building permits data from 20 of the 22 uh, areas within the WAMPO region that, that we 
um, are forecasting for. So that's pretty darn good, actually. We were expecting fewer than that. Um, so that gives us a lot of confidence in actually that this is a pretty inclusive model. Now, um, what that the, the upshot of that is that it moved the needle a whole lot from when I spoke to this group uh, several weeks ago at the last TPB meeting. That table on the right is the difference in, uh, in population from the model with uh, like the current model that uses building permits data compared to the model without it. You can see that it increased the overall regional population by, all, by over 37,000 people. Um, and a lot of that uh, increase was in uh, some of the larger communities, but particularly ones that have had really, really major uh, like investments into their housing uh, areas, like uh, like Derby, I think is the largest on there in terms of the increase from building permits and then second being maize, right? Um, now, what this does to the actual regional growth trends, right, is that puts the cumulative growth from 2020, uh, I'll say that as well, is that our starting place, we use the 2020 census, since that's the most accurate. Um, uh, and from 2020 to 2050, uh, that leaves us with a cumulative 21% population growth, uh, which is a little bit higher than what we would imagine uh, based on our previous a regional forecast, but it's within the margin that we're comfortable with um, at an annualized uh, growth rate of 0.71%. Um, and if you compare that to without the building permits, you can really see the difference that makes because it, uh, it went up from 0.5% annualized growth. Um, the, the current uh, cumulative growth in that like green bordered table, it kind of center low left, is the cumulative growth by 2050 broken out by some of these communities? And you can see that with that building permits data compared to without on the right, it really, really made, uh, made a very big difference for uh, like, uh, well, most of them, but in particular communities like Goddard and Mays, as I mentioned earlier, that have had a lot of major investments and even like larger communities like Derby with that uh, factored in, it's still growing by 55%. So uh, that's very significant there. The migration estimates as they exist overall uh, come out to these. These are revised from uh, from the previous meeting that we had here um, uh, and uh, already talked about where that came from. Um, so where do we go from here? Uh, th that table on the right is the uh, table of which communities have provided us data. Uh, if we don't hear from the remaining two communities, uh, then these will be the final numbers that get uh, get presented on or July 22nd for uh, TAC formal recommendation, uh, and the numbers that get presented for formal rec uh, for approval or sorry excuse me approval um, uh, on August 18th uh, here at TPB. So uh, at this time, does anybody have any questions? Any questions for Jonathan? I know that when this first was presented, I think this is the maybe third or fourth time this item has come to us at the TBV. I know it started because Commissioner group. Dennis had great questions and made us want to dig a little bit deeper to make sure that we were getting the most accurate and consistent, consistently gathered information from, from all the different jurisdictions. So thank you again, Commissioner, yeah, for raising you. questions so that this can be better. Um, does anybody have any questions for Peter or Jonathan? Looks like Nick has an idea. And one one correction, it is not August 18th, it's August 13th. That's a typo of mine. Okay, thank you so much. Yes, council member. Um, two questions here for you. Yes. Um, the first one is where, what starting point of population did you start from? We started with the 2020 census. So uh, we last year we did an initial forecast that was based on a different methodology that was using the census ACS from 2021 as our starting place. And there was some concerns about like whether that was actually an accurate count for uh, for that, and starting with the 2020 census put us both in alignment with, uh, with well, what communities felt was a more accurate count uh, for the year 2020, and it also was uh, the year that uh, was typically referenced as far as those 10 year increments in uh, previous population surveys. Okay. Another question is, uh, how often will you be looking at this to revise it? Let, let's say in uh, when the 2030 comes out and uh, the projections are, you know, pretty off, uh, is it, will it be a revised again then? 
So currently we don't have a plan to, uh, to revise it, but that is something that we can absolutely come back to in the future. I'll let perhaps Peter speak to that. Great. To answer your question, council member, we'll likely look at these every five years when we develop our long range transportation plan. And I imagine we'll do a similar reach out to every community and try to include them with some of their own data that uh, kind of enlightens what might happen with their population growth. Will that next five years be the 25 or is it, are we talking 29? That would probably be when we'd work on our, be working on our next long range plan would be 29. Uh, and one other uh, that I was noticing on Eastboro, it's, you know, obviously decreasing, but obviously um, Eastboro can't get bigger and they can't really get smaller. Um, wouldn't that stay the same? So, so within the methodology, right, essentially how we arrive at that number is through the aging up of the population. Um, one of the one of the challenges with any kind of long term in particular, uh, like projection technique is uh, trying to figure out an even handed way of doing it. The, the model that we chose right in aging people up uh, in order to support uh, like a consistent population in an area that is not expanding and doesn't really have a history of expanding over the last five and 10 years uh, is that typically you will have an existing population that ages up and it doesn't have those hallmarks for in migration to kind of buoy it. Right. Uh, so that, that is a concern. Um, uh, yes. Uh, so, uh, so in short, it is certainly possible that it could maintain its population better than this. Yeah, j just marketing wise for the city of Eastboro, I, I would hate to see that sure. um, um, when, when it drops, what, uh, you know, 75 homes or something. And I mean, the homes in there are really nice. I don't anticipate seeing them going away. Mm -hmm. So, so over the last several weeks, we've had this period where we've been meeting with individuals and representatives from communities to air concerns you know of that nature for now like we, we were trying to have that done by yesterday if there are some serious concerns about Eastboro that is something that we can look at as far as scheduling a conversation to look at you know a way of perhaps um, better understanding a way to account for that yeah d just with almost 11 percent decrease over the next uh, 30 years it just seems uh, a little concerning. And mm -hmm. if I live there, I, I think I would be concerned as well. Mm -hmm. So just marketing wise, I, I think we need to, you know, look at that again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's good feedback. And uh, like, if that's, that, if that is a concern, we're happy to, to discuss that. Yes. Question. What was your adjustment factor to meet that county population? I know, I know in our conversations, when you reached out, you talked a little bit about Mm -hmm. that adjustment to meet what the county anticipated right uh, so Let's that you do that at the end so what you're referring to is our regional constraint right so when we did the population projection uh last year uh for the county level when we looked at this whole, looked at the whole state looked at the whole region um which in a lot of ways is easier to predict right when you're looking at macro trends um our target right uh, for this region was to be within our margin of confidence uh, in alignment with that model. The annualized growth rate based on that would have been 0.67% annualized. Um, currently it stands at 0.71. So uh, we're, we actually, based on this data, are a little bit more optimistic than that was. Uh, how we in essence arrived at that uh, is by allowing the communities to grow unconstrained, right? Uh, like without the regional constraint, looking at what the spillover beyond that threshold was, right? So like how many people are we in excess of what our target is? Looking at the fraction uh, in 2050 that each city represents of the total regional population. And then given that fraction for each city, subtracting back a number of people from each community based on that final share of the region. That, that, that was a bit of a lot, but uh, like we did have a methodology here. Jennifer. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Um, if I can ask a, a, a similar question, but I'm just wondering, as we put this information together, 
um, and I'm from Clearwater, by the way, um, who could, you know, when they get access to this, when it comes to marketing or whatever, I guess when we first brought this up, my concern was, is we put this together and then when is this going to surface and determine funding, determine uh, how different projects may be viewed, if they look at this and say, well, that that growth rate isn't supportive of it versus what we might see locally. So what's the intent of using this? So I personally cannot really speak to that. Uh, like, uh, I don't have a lot of expertise in uh, how allocation for funding is handled. Uh, I really, I am just existing on the numbers side, which is actually one of the real benefits of uh, WAMPO coming to an outside organization is we don't have a stake in it. Right. We, like we get to handle this in an unbiased way. And we're, we're certainly receptive to feedback and concerns with the methodology. But there is no agenda on our side to either boost or lower numbers erroneously and for no reason. And not saying that there would be no reason there. Uh, but uh, so I, I personally don't have any comment on funding allocation is really the answer to your question. Thank you for the response and thank you for the question. Peter, Chad, I, I asked that question too. How are we going to use this data? What will we do with it? Could you maybe address that, either of you, both of you? Peter, thank you, Peter. And um, Mayor, that's a great question on uh, whether funding is tied to the population. And um, there's no direct relationship for that in terms of when when we have this evaluation criteria for the project selection committee, how the projects are funded, this is one of the criteria among the many that goes into it. You know, um, for example, um, the age of the bridges as an example for the criteria or the connectivity. Um, and among the many criteria and, and also the model forecast when it takes into consideration, it would also show um, the growth in the roadways than the growth in the population in the cities. Because from the transportation perspective in the evaluation criteria, the growth in the forecast demand on transportation system becomes the criteria than you know, is the city growing with the population or not? So there's no direct way of saying that, you know, this is dependent on the growth. So they are totally two independent tasks, you know, how the projects are funded and how the, you know, how the forecasts are made. Uh, but in general, they do contribute through the forecast on travel demand through these growth of communities. You know, and at times, if maize is growing, uh, the communities may travel to Wichita for jobs, and there could be transportation demand in Wichita grow because you know how the commuters are traveling from maize to Wichita. So the system uh, shows that the growth in you know in the demand is on the roadways in Wichita at times, and vice versa. The same thing with the Wichita is growing, there could be you know employers in outskirts like Bel Air or or other outskirts. So there's, there's no direct relationship, but there is an indirect relationship, which is complex. <laughs> but I try to answer the best, but there is more to it. Thank you. So a question I have about the model. Have you looked at the uh, census data that they projected from uh, 2023? The last I've seen was July 1, 2023. So, yes, we did look at it. We decided we, we opt not to use any other organizations forecasts as our starting point, just for the purpose of I mean, part of the purpose of CEDBR is to make forecast. And with us being the official provider of the census, we certainly have a competency in it. Um, we aren't entirely clear on what the methodology is there. They use their own set of assumptions and they're like what we do know of their methodology is it does differ in a number of ways from our previous population forecasts. So having a starting place that we really understand, i.e. the uh, population projections that we did last year um, and using this kind of revamped methodology that we developed last year, or I should say, we iterated on our um, like historical population projection method. We do have a very solid uh, way of going about it. And you're right. Um, those population projections have the more recent starting point, but that would put it out of alignment with 
what the historical trend data has been using those 10 year increments. So we opted to use the census data as a starting point and use our own methodology, just adapted for the communities. Thank does you. that, does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. Cause, okay. and you probably know this, but several of the communities that you put in here in 2025, according to 2023 census data are, are already, already there. That pop, yeah. That population or bigger. So I've, yes. and I don't know how accurate that is. I know it's all projection. So mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. okay. Thank you. Commissioner Dennis. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Of course. Um, Chad, maybe I didn't quite understand exactly what you said about how you're going to use population, but let me give you an example. Uh, the unincorporated areas you're showing is going to decrease by 15,000 between now and 2050. And um, I, I, I expect that that's probably possible because people are moving from the county into the cities and the cities are expanding and they're annexing land and that's out in the county and so forth. Uh, but my worry is if you use these population projections in order to uh, take care of funding for those different organizations, for example, the unincorporated areas, which Sedgwick County takes care of, now you've eliminated funding for those connecting roads that get between all of these growing areas. So if you concentrate on population rather than connections, why well, you've just stopped all ability to connect these uh, communities. Do you understand what I'm trying to get at? Yeah, I, th I think that's a fair point. I, I wouldn't, I mean, I can't speak for Chad, but my two cents would be this is one of the tools in our tool belt in decision-making process. I think it would be connectivity. It would be population. I mean, I, Chad, say more. You're the expert. And, uh, I, I think you're absolutely right, Commissioner Dennis. Uh, um, there are many components to it. The connectivity and the growth in the suburbs, uh, that is also plays a role into the evaluation criteria as well. It is, it is just that there is no direct relationship, but there is uh, these things are considered in the project selection process and the funding as well. Uh, but there's no direct relationship between because this is growing. But at times there are, uh, you know, there are instances where project selection committee would make a decision that there is a, you know, there's a growth in this. We need to address this facility needs improvement. Because again, it depends on the facility as well. The facility is in good shape. So those are the considerations. So that's that's one of the things why we think these two are two different things, that population projections is a different task and funding and those criteria, those are all different tasks. But it does take into consideration what you mentioned, Commissioner Dennis, uh, when it comes to project selection committee, uh, you know, uh, evaluating all the factors that's one of the factors that you mentioned as well. No, great. That was a great I, question. I guess that you'd have to reevaluate those on individual circumstances when those happen to that certain city or area um, when it comes up, I, I assume. But I also agree with uh, uh, Mayor Jim from Bel Air that, you know, some of the numbers that are projected are, you know, higher, um, just like Andover is. I mean, right now we're projecting already at 2030. And so, I mean, that's a little bit higher, a lot higher than what, what you're showing. But uh, I think we're already at our 2030 as of now. Hmm. So, um, I, you know, we just need to be careful how these numbers are put out marketing wise and for funding wise. And uh, if... Did you say that Andover is possibly already at its 2030 estimate? Correct. Um, that I I would be very interested in uh, hearing where that number comes from. Um, uh, like uh, if that is a based on a pre-existing projection, uh, it really does matter what the the methodology on getting to that point was. Um, one of the uh, one one of the factors that has come into a lot of previous projections that uh, we've talked with with various community members would be, for example, doing like and making an assumption that the household size remains the same into the future. Some of the communities in the region have a very high uh, like size of household, like three or more people, um, which is very much out of line with, uh, with how that number tends to grow over time. Uh, and so I, I did see a model that uh, used that assumption that household size would remain at three 
uh, like in a forecast and that tended to overinflate that. But so you, you end up with a lot of questions about methodology and looking at existing um, projections. And so that's, that's really why we develop our own is so that we know the ins and outs of it. So I, I am certainly interested in uh, hearing where that number comes from. My friend, Mike Moyardi, do you have your hand raised? I do not. Oh, Sorry. okay. No problem. We're just hoping for your wisdom. Any other questions, comments, concerns? I got a quick yes. Question. Just of course. More of a curiosity question, I guess. In terms of um, looking, I saw a report on, on Goddard the other day that talked about population or transfer or job inflows and outflows, and and I was just curious how that kind of ties into this whole discussion because I was surprised at the amount of of inflow that we have coming into Goddard in comparison to the outflow going into Wichita. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was really kind of an interesting. So inflows and outflows is a, a bit of a different conversation. Uh, like as it relates to this projection method, uh, CEDBR did develop an employment forecast for each of the communities. That is one of the factors in our migration estimate. We, we don't use, uh, it's it's the, the Census Longitudinal Employer Household Dynamic Database, LEHD, that looks at uh, inflows and outflows from communities. We don't use their data uh, like as an input. It's something that we've looked at and was very much of interest to us. It worked better for um, th this methodology to just use a uh, an employment forecast for that component of it. So then that brings the next question. Does that data get looked at on the spending side of things as you're going along mm -hmm. and looking at road projects and things, is that considered? Yes, Mayor, that would be one of the factors by the Product Selection Committee to look at, yeah, absolutely. Any other questions or comments? All right, thank you for the robust discussion. Thank you for all your work on this, appreciate it. Uh, we will move on to the next item, committee and partnership updates. Just very quickly, executive committee will be meeting August, Thursday, August 15th at 11 a.m. It is an open meeting, so anyone who would like to come and, and join, you can either join virtually or you can attend the meeting. It's over in the Metropolitan Area Planning Department conference room, or there's always a link online where you can join. So please feel free to join executive committee on August 15th if you are interested. Um, next, we'll go to Gahedat. I know Mike is virtual, and then we have folks here in the room. So whoever wants to go first. All right, I can go first. Apologies for being virtual today. I will make a commitment to be there next month, though. Uh, just quickly wanted to let everybody know uh, we are officially kicking off the K-15 uh, corridor planning process this Friday. So the project team will be convening in Derby, uh, along with our consultant, uh, Trans Systems, to uh, officially kick off that that planning process. So you can expect to hear some updates from that. Probably not next month, but the month after we should have some kind of early report uh, from that effort. Uh, and with that, I'll keep it short today. And that concludes my remarks. And I will certainly stand for any questions. Any questions for Mike? All right. Stay cool, my friend. We'll see you next month. How about our folks here? Uh, hi there, J.P. Wilson, Public Information Officer for KDOT. Um, on Friday, July 12th, northbound I-135 from 2nd to 9th Street will have the right and center lane closed until 5 a.m. Monday morning, at which point the center lane will be reopened. The ramp uh, from uh, the on-ramp from 2nd Street will be closed while this section of the right lane is receiving maintenance. For a piece of good news, the bridge from westbound US 54 to the Eisenhower Airport Parkway rehabilitation has been completed. Um, it's really smooth. I, I recommend it. Uh, <laughs> this is uh, this five is, stars. <laughs> oh, yeah. This is phase one of a three phase project. So uh, we completed that. Now, currently, we have north and southbound Eisen Eisenhower Parkway. Uh, we'll have their center and left lanes closed for maintenance. Completion is as estimated for August. Uh, and lastly, uh, on I-135 northbound ramp to westbound US-54 is currently receiving milling, patching, and overlay. This phase of the project is uh, currently set to be concluded in August as well. Excellent. Thank you. I, I'm just noticing we all got a copy of this. Would you want to make any comments about this? Is this from KDOT? Nope. Where did this guy come from? 
You got in the mail. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Coupons next month, Chad. Come on. <laughs> That's fantastic. Yes, please, Council Member. Uh, JB, uh, can you have do you have any updates on the construction start of uh, 96 to 159th on Kellogg? That would be, I guess, phase one. Um, Does somebody know? Uh, was you saying 96 or, or uh, Kellogg? The, the, uh, the, at the intersection of 96 on oh. Kellogg. Yeah. Along Kellogg, east to, I guess, one wood drive. Right. Plans are still being developed, and uh, I think there's a tentative uh, letting uh, early next year, but that's still subject to change. So, I think I had heard recently there was some lane closures that were happening in July. Is that correct? Preliminary engineering, drilling, things like that for geology work. Okay. All right. That, that's all train systems, I'm assuming, right? Thank you, Brett, with Trend Systems. It takes a village at WIMPO. So appreciate you being here. Thank you for your input. Thank you, KDOT. Appreciate it very much. Um, next, Rick with Federal Highway Administration. Thanks for joining us today. Any updates for us? Had to step away? Okay. Thank you very much, Alan, for watching for us. Rick had an uh, update that uh, he has hired a planner, uh, you know, liaison that Federal Highway Administration has. It's been a long time that he was uh, waiting to hire one, so he will announce that at the next meeting. Um, so that that's all. That's all the update from Rick that he wanted to share with you. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for being here today. Truly appreciate your time and your commitment to this organization. And thank you to staff for all you do. I always say I know that by the end, for our guests who also were here presenting today, by the time something gets to the podium, a lot of work has gone into it so that you can present us with good information so that we can in turn make good decisions. So your time and effort and commitment to WAMPO is not lost on me and I'm, I'm very grateful for you all, all you do. So with that, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. Thank you, is there a second? All those in favor say aye. Anyone opposed can stay. See you next month. <laughs>